Good evening. I'm Jack Hemingway, and welcome to Incredible Idaho. We're lucky here. Idaho really is incredible. We have wild animals in places that the rest of the country is lost. But even here in Idaho, certain wild animals are rarely seen. We'd like to share a couple of those with you tonight. For example, the elusive harlequin duck, because of its need for undisturbed nesting, is very difficult to find in Idaho. Each spring, the harlequin duck leaves its Pacific Ocean home for Idaho's lush panhandle forests. They come to find nesting shelter along the cold, clear mountain streams that tumble into Priest Lake. They are really unusual, that, and that's what's one of the neat things about them, is they're so beautiful. The name Harlequin is taken from the 17th century Italian clowns, known for their vibrant costumes. Like the jester, the male of the species is patterned with brightly colored plumage. But even in this clown costume, he is still very difficult to find. Fish and game research biologist Francis Cassier spends her spring and early summer searching for sign of this shy waterfowl. Should be just a little short ways down the stream here. And uh, when I saw them, they moved downstream a little ways, but they should still be here. In 1986, the harlequin duck was classified as a sensitive species. This means there are concerns about population numbers. A study was funded by the U.S. Forest Service to study the pristine mountain streams that harlequins seek out. Um, there's very little historical information on harlequins, so we don't know if They've always been rare, or if it's something recent, if it's something that, that's man-caused, or if it's natural. So that's what we're trying to find out. After hours of tromping through brush in the icy rain, a pair of harlequins is finally sighted. It's time to go to work. A device called a mist net is strung across the fast-moving water. It's pretty hard to see it. It's real hard to see it. We just bought a smaller net. We've been using a a 42-foot net for, for streams like this. You've got to be kind of creative to get, <laughs> get the stream size. In theory, biologist Mark Ulliman will gently herd the ducks downstream into the nearly invisible trap. But in the wildlife world, theories don't always play out. Somewhere along the way, the harlequins escape. And it's back on the trail again for Francis and Mark. We want to find out um, movements of the ducks on the stream, and we're real interested in finding out nesting areas. Another pair is spotted, and the biologists go back to work setting up the mist net once again. They're the only duck that's adapted to living on these, to breeding on these fast water streams. They don't breed anywhere else. They don't breed on lakes or slow-moving rivers. They only use uh, fast-moving mountain streams. This time it pays off. When the ducks swim into view, Mark startles them into flight, right into the net. The biologists rescue their catch, a brightly colored male. The female eludes capture once again. We're gonna band him with a Fish and Wildlife Service leg band, and then we're gonna um, take a couple of measurements and nasal mark him. If this had been the female, a radio transmitter would also be attached, allowing researchers to discover more about their unusual nesting habits. Some things we've been finding out about them are, so, are somewhat similar to other sea ducks. They, uh, they have long-term pair bonds. That's over several years, even though they split up when the female starts incubating. So they have to f find each other again back out on the coast. The study has revealed that even though they migrate to these nesting streams, they may not breed, or they may be failing at it. It's one of the many mysteries still surrounding these beautiful birds. But that's just what intrigues researcher Francis Kassir. One thing I enjoy about this work is that generally we tend to think that you need to go to, to uh, South America or Africa to study species that, people, that aren't known very well, but yet here in Idaho we have a, species, a number of species, and one of them is harlequins, where 
very little is known about them, so uh, it's pretty exciting uh, just learning their, about their life history. Luck is improving for the Hollican research team. They discovered a nest in an old hollow cottonwood. So far, the hen and her seven eggs are doing just fine. When savage icy storms brutally rip the far reaches of Scandinavia, the native Laplanders call it a wolf winter. During the Second World War, Hitler's deadly submarine wolf packs terrorized Allied shipping. Cry wolf, wolf in sheep's clothing, wolf at the door. Throughout history, wolf has implied evil. But what's beyond the folklore? What do we really know about the wolf? This is a sound seldom heard in Idaho. The last known wolf pack was killed near the Middle Fork of the Salmon River sometime between 1928 and 1936. Now there is only silence. For thousands of years, the wolf roamed the mountains and valleys of Idaho. Elk, deer, and vast herds of buffalo shared the land and provided a prey base. Then, in the late 1800s, white settlers descended on the west and with them came domestic livestock. Soon there was no room for both buffalo and cattle. By 1890, the buffalo was gone from Idaho. The turn of the century saw the demand for meat and hides all but eliminate the elk population in central Idaho. As wildlife faded away, the wolf began substituting beef for buffalo, and the war was on. Strychnine poisoning and bounties on wolves at the turn of the century devastated the wolf population. Between 1894 and 1900, 22,000 wolves were bountied in Montana alone. In Idaho, few were left by the 1930s. The wolf had been virtually eliminated by a more powerful predator, man. Today, the wolf is listed as an endangered species in most of the continental United States. But even now, Myths and hearsay about this species have a powerful influence on the human imagination. Research studies conducted in northern Minnesota, where a viable wolf population remains, have separated some facts from fiction. The proximity of wolves in farmland prompted this study on depredation by Steve Fritz of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, as I recall, the figure is somewhere around uh, three-tenths of a, of a percent uh, on an annual basis. Uh, suffer uh, depredations. And Farmers in Minnesota are compensated by the state for verified livestock losses, and offending wolves are trapped and removed. In some cases, uh, you see management practices that probably predispose farmers to having problems. One of the practices that we identified is uh, disposing of livestock carcasses, uh, you know, animals that die over the winter by just dragging them a short distance from, from farmyards, and we think that this attracts wolves. Still, most wolves live near livestock without causing problems. Across the Idaho border near Missoula, hopes were high that six orphaned wolf pups could stay away from the cattle in Nine Mile Valley. Yeah, I think it's a wait and see. I, I think most people, as long as they leave the cattle alone, there's not uh, any big problem. Rancher Ralph Thisted had a special relationship with the pups. 
when it was established that both parents had been killed. Ralph agreed that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service could leave roadkill deer in his front yard for the pups until they could make it on their own. Early in the morning, Ralph would grab his video camera and wait for the pups to make their appearance. As far as having them here, uh, I don't know. I just, uh, I still don't know for sure. I mean. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but you couldn't let six little orphan pups with a, go hungry. It was a fun learning experience for Ralph and a big help to researcher Mike Jimenez of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I just kind of call Mike and tell him what happened that day, I guess, most of the time. Oh, how many, when they came out, and I think he asked me to watch for, you know, if one limped or had a, you know, after the trapping. Last fall, the wolves were trapped to radio collar them. This way, Mike could track their movements as they grew more independent. What we're trying to do is just kind of keep tabs on where they are. Uh, we keep tabs on, on the numbers, what they're eating, and we're trying to see that, you know, that they're not coming back into the area with their cattle, and if they are, we watch them real close. Late this spring, the pups did depredate, killing a steer on a cattle ranch. In compliance with the Endangered Species Act, they were caught and removed from the area. We've come a long way from the days of poisons and bounties. Here in Idaho, more than 600 wolf sightings have been reported since 1974. Researcher Rob Kortz of the Payette National Forest is hoping to confirm reports of wolves along the south fork of the Salmon River. Well, here's our, uh, one of our camera sets. Basically what they do is they've got a little tripwire that goes out to the uh, carcass and when the predator comes and disturbs the carcass, it sets off the camera and they take their own picture. Another device is a motion sensitive okay, camera. It's an infrared camera that's triggered by the movement of a warm animal. It's important for biologists to secure solid evidence of the presence of wolves. Sightings by the public may not always be reliable. People are commonly mistaking coyote tracks for uh, wolf tracks. As you can see, there is a great deal of difference in the size. If there are wolves here in Idaho, and the evidence points that way, will livestock depredation figures mirror those of Minnesota? Annually, less than one-half percent of farms suffer a loss to this predator. It's a very, very tough question. Uh, there's so many variables in this. My gut feeling is that uh, the uh, depredation losses here will be somewhere in the same general range as they are in, in Canada uh, and in Minnesota. Uh, but uh, all we can do is wait and see, I guess. For the past 200 years in the United States, mankind and his economics have dictated which wild animals are acceptable. Many suggest, in our haste, we may have unbalanced the grand design that made the ecosystem complete. Perhaps with more maturity, society can overcome the myths and folklore woven around the wolf, and we can once again thrill to the sound of wild things in the wild places of Idaho. A year ago, 10 lambs were born to radio-colored bighorn sheep along the Salmon River. Eight weeks later, all 10 had died. Concerned biologists at the Idaho Department of Fish and Game devised a bold experiment. Pregnant ewes were captured and flown to a research facility to be monitored until the lambs were born. Last month, Incredible Idaho brought you along on the two capture operations one at Big Creek Drainage and the other near Chalice on Morgan Creek. The decision to capture a wild animal is not made lightly. Stress to the animal is inevitable, and even more so when an animal is pregnant. But attempts to study diseased lambs in the wild provided little information over the last two years, except the fact that bighorn lambs are still dying at an alarming rate. This year, we're, we're taking some out of the wild, we're being a little bit more aggressive, but we're going to get a good database from these animals. 
After nearly six weeks at the research facility, the sheep appear ready to drop their lambs. The expectant mothers are rounded up for their trip to the veterinarian's maternity ward. They have uh, several diseases, which any one of which could cause the demise of the young ones. But remember, if the mother had the disease, she should have produced antibody that will be passed on through to, to the youngster. Hopefully, speculations such as this okay. will be resolved as these sheep and their offspring are monitored in the weeks ahead. Give, give me your hand. Give me your hand. You feel a hoof right here. Nervous as an expectant father, wildlife veterinarian Dave Hunter monitors the ewes on the way to the operating table. The decision has been made to take the lambs by caesarean section. We're being very aggressive about this because we've only got a population of three. We can't afford to lose any of these. Okay, here it comes. You got a clamp? Okay. Let's see. Oh, come on, little bugger. Is he taking a gas bath? They're born in fluid. You got to get that fluid out of there, so hold them upside down. Oh, here we go. There it is. Come on, baby. Let go of that stuff. You can't breathe that anymore. If this lamb were born in the wild, the journey through the birth canal would have squeezed the fluids from his lungs. That's the stuff you want out there. That's a good baby. Good baby. So, Dave, she's breathing. She's, got yep. she's on her own so far. She's a good full-term little lamb. While the second bighorn is being prepared for surgery, the first milk is pumped from the new mother. What's important about getting, letting, allowing the animal to have the first milk, the colostrum produces uh, or contains about 90% uh, of the antibodies that the ewe has produced toward diseases in her lifetime. And that gives the lamb protection until that lamb reaches about six or eight weeks of age. All right. <laughs> Yay. Is that just like mom? Look at that. Another healthy lamb is pulled from the womb of his mother. This marks the first time lambs have been taken successfully by caesarean section from wild sheep. Any pretty little thing? Three weeks later, the lambs are king of the hill and of everyone's heart at the research facility. Right now, they're healthy as can be. We take blood tests now, it'll be every two weeks, and it'll be every week once we put them back with their mothers. And we're gonna check for disease exposure, and we're gonna check for the signs, early signs that something's going wrong. The third sheep delivered her lamb naturally, the tests on the baby ewe indicate pasturella organisms already present, the culprit that triggers death for bighorns. The little lamb is already geared up to have problems, but you can see from the way this little guy's running around that she's not having any problems yet. So whatever kicks or trips this pasturella over to be, become more virulent or deadly, uh, we, we can see that it's not in the little one yet. So. Now it's a waiting game. This is the critical time for these little lambs. At three to eight weeks, they must begin producing their own antibodies, or they will succumb to the same diseases that killed last year's lambs in the backcountry. It's a waiting game as well for wildlife veterinarian Dave Hunter, but the quiet moments have their rewards. Something very soothing about coming up here about 10 o'clock at night for the last feeding, and it's kind of dark in this heat lamp. And you feed them, and that kind of suckling sound, you know, They'll come up and they'll snuggle up to you right afterwards. It's almost like bonding with my daughters when they were young. Dave Hunter reports that the smaller of the two male lambs is beginning to show signs of disease and may possibly die. But what can be learned from this little fellow may possibly save a whole generation of wild lambs in Idaho's backcountry. Unlike the harlequin ducks that we saw earlier who like to nest in seclusion, gulls and terns sometimes bunch together by the thousands to nest on a single island. As we say goodnight, we'd like to share with you the commotion of these colony nesters. Blackfoot Reservoir in southeast Idaho plays host to three of these species. The California gull, the ring-billed gull, and the Caspian tern congregate noisily every nesting season on a 50-yard rock called Gull Island. 